All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. So the discussion today is about the nasal spray, especially in the context of COVID. There is a lot of diversity in various studies and the results and the behaviors of these medicines. Then there are some drugs, for example, povidone iodine, which may uh, modulate the thyroid hormone function, which can be bad. Similarly, povidone iodine, for example, in case of first trimester of pregnancy can cause developmental issues for fetus as well. So there is a lot of content to go over. So before I go over that, you many times I see that folks are trying to judge me to say, this is Mubin himself believing these things. My job is to present medical information. The only issue is sometimes I have to talk about FDA as well. And FDA is not the most logical of the organization to discuss. And so I cannot stand behind what they say. I can just present what they're doing. So my own situation, I had been using this. This is Cofix RX and it really helped me. So that is just one person's anecdote. I also am a fan on a personal level of uh, salt water sprays in the pharynx and nose. Although I felt they were less valuable for me when I had COVID compared to this. This is povidone iodine 1.25% and um, I have been using that. So with this, this is where I stand. I want to now present you various FDA's positions, and then various studies, some that say it works, some that say it uh, these sprays do not work, and then various type of sprays. So let's start our discussion. So these are our gifts for humanity, and they are continuing. We're going to start from, there are so many categories of nasal sprays. And the nasal sprays range from just saline to help moist the nose or uh, salt solutions to help dry the nose or atropine-like sprays, more potent sprays to dry or decongestants. Then antiseptics, as FDA calls them, uh, antiseptic sprays and so on. So the ones that I want to look at today together nitric oxide, povidone iodine, mixtures, and then some more, for example, carrageenan and some other. Now, these sprays, they come in various strengths as well. For example, povidone iodine, you would see 0.5% or 1% or 1.5% or 2% or 2.5. Higher it goes, the more dangerous it can become. So now before we go into the discussion, I wanted to make sure that we look at how FDA has been serving us. I wish if I had the control of FDA, I would really make it very lean and focused. So let me show you something beforehand. So here is a book. This book is written by Google, I believe, Google engineers, Jake Knapp and John Zeratsky. The book's title is Make Time. I believe everyone in FDA and CDC should have one copy of this book. This would help them understand where not to waste time and where to focus their efforts instead of asking for $1.2 billion more so that they can sit at their laurels and do nothing while Big Pharma does all the work for them. So anyways, with this advice for FDA, let's get back to how FDA has been helping us. And quotation marks with that. So FDA is saying, FDA is doing the following. So this is drbean.com and there is a link in the description with drbean.com, more 900 more videos. Nowadays, I've started doing something interesting and that is every day 
in the morning, I do one extra lecture that goes only on drbean.com and that is only for Dr. Bean subscribers. So there's a link in the description with really cheap value, inexpensive. Okay, let's look at FDA and hold on to your blood pressure apparatuses because this can, to some extent, make you upset. So there is a letter from FDA to Viral Dean LLC. I'm not going to read the whole letter, but what they're saying here to Viral Dean is unapproved new drug product related to coronavirus disease. So this was a nasal spray where they probably claimed that it will help against COVID-19 based on the studies that we would discuss today as well. FDA came back and they said, we have looked at your viraldine.com on December 21, 2021 and March 1, 2022. And we have found that you are talking about an antiseptic nasal spray. This spray has not been approved or has not been declared safe and, safe and effective by us. So hence, you cannot say this or sell this. And neither have you gotten an application with us to declare it safe and effective or see it. And I can actually see that many times this is a big pharma game. Big pharma can influence FDA easily, in my opinion. I may be wrong. But for little guys, it is very difficult to get these products moving. So this is the FDA's letter to them. And if you continue to see some of the things, therefore, FDA is taking urgent measures to protect consumers from certain products that without approval or authorization by FDA claim to mitigate, prevent, treat, diagnose, or cure COVID-19 in people. When I look at these kind of statements, and then I look at how FDA has been doing with other therapeutics that they approve of and have been turning their blind eye to their efficacy or their harm or the side effects, this makes me angry. You cannot imagine how difficult it was for me to read through these because in here the FDA comes so saintly that they have nothing but the best of our interest in their mind. So based on the above claims and statements and they go over what things are said wrong. So here they are now educating this company and saying these consumer topical antiseptic and oral antiseptic products are new drugs within the meaning of section blah because they are not generally recognized as safe and effective for use under the conditions prescribed recommended or suggested in their labeling then they continue on they say that we have a section an ordinance about over-the-counter drugs, that is tentative final monograph entitled Topical Administrate Antimicrobial Drug Products for Over-the-Counter Human Use. They actually call it tentative final monograph, and it was in 1994 or something, and they have never moved it from tentative to actual final. That is the level of their concern and work. Over the course of these rule makings, three active ingredients, benzyl, benzalconium chloride, ethyl alcohol, and isopropyl alcohol were classified as category three for use in consumer antiseptic rub products, meaning that additional safety and effectiveness data are needed to support the determination, a determination that a drug pro product containing one of these active ingredients would be graze for use as a consumer product. And then they talk about the same for the nasal spray as well. And they say, hey, in February 9, 1994, we had declared this as well as a tentative final monograph of over-the-counter nasal sprays for what will it mean for them to be antiseptic. And if they are antiseptic, we have to approve them. The FDA actually never moved that tentative final monograph to actually a final monograph. They just left it like that since 1994, and we are all still bound with that. So this is one letter they sent, and then they demanded cease and desist down here. They said FTC, FTC cease and desist demand. Then they say, hey, within 24 or 48 hours, you need to stop this and tell us if you cannot and so on. 
Then they said something else that really made me angry. They said, if you're not located in the United States, please note that products that appear to be misbranded or unapproved new drugs may be detained or refused admission if they are offered for imp importation into the United States. But check this out. Then they say, we may advise the appropriate regulatory officials in the country from which you operate that FDA considers your product referenced above to be unapproved and misbranded products that cannot be legally sold to consumers in the United States. So FDA is busy sending such letters. They are busy creating, you're not a horse, you're not a cow tweets. They are busy going out to Emma to say, ask the pharmacists to do this or not to do that. This is FDA. So when they sent this letter to Viraldine, I went to Viraldine's site. Viraldine, what they have done is they have simply said, povidone iodine nasal spray and throat spray for sinus congestion and allergy relief. On their site, there is no mention of COVID, SARS-CoV-2 at all. They just scrubbed it all, simply said sinus relief. Then this little product that is in my hand, Cofix RX. They wrote, so I was trying to reach out to the Cofix RX site and try to see where, where they are. And so here I just found out in April, FDA wrote them a letter as well. And it is the same letter, same template. It's just that these product names are different. So Cofix RX, in, I believe in response, just removed their website. So they actually don't exist anymore. Then here is the Sanotize. I think that many of you are aware that we talked about Sanotize a few months ago. It's a, it is a Canadian company that uses nitric oxide in the, their nasal spray. And they are actually now in Israel, Bahrain, Thailand, Indonesia, Singapore, Nepal, and now they are working with the European Union to get the CE mark. However, they just very simply write it over here. It is not yet approved for sale in Canada or the United States. So the there are many people who will jump in and say, hey, what FDA is doing is really helpful. I keep looking at empirical data. You know that whenever I look at studies for vaccines or not vaccines or vaccines benefit or harm, I always discuss that you should look at empirical data as well. You should look at what is happening around you as well. In this case as well, we should look at the empirical data. And if FDA believes that they have really protected us as a consumer in the U.S., then we should see what happened to us during COVID in the U.S. compared to many other countries that were similar to us. And that would tell us how better protection did we actually get. Okay, so this is sanitize. Now I'm going to go over some of the studies. Before I go over the studies, some of them are going to say povidone iodine, for example, doesn't work. Some of them are going to say they work very good. So we're going to look at them. Before we go there, two more things that are actually important. It has nothing to do with FDAs or others. This is just simple care. Povidone iodine has iodine. And its long-term use, long-term use, can disrupt iodine metabolism and thyroid function. That in turn, so if you see here, the evidence for using PVPI as PEP is neither clear nor clinical. So this is a letter. Placing those concerns aside, 15% of the population with thyroid disease are excluded from P PVPI use. So that is first important thing to note. But a similar proportion who are not as yet undiagnosed with thyroid disease, remain at physiological risk from inadvertent exposure to iodine PVP. 
In healthy patients, iodine exposure initiates the wolf jacob effect, transiently reducing thyroid hormone levels, and this is a valuable response to control hypermetabolic morbidity and mortality from the thyroid storm. However, for patients with under unrecognized thyroid dysfunction, iodine exposure can either lead to chronic hypothyroidism with no adaptation to wolf jacob downregulation, or it can lead to hose or jaws best out phenomena and critical thyroid storm initiates from a loss of negative feedback. The point is, it is important to keep in mind for those patients who may have thyroid dysregulation or may even have a, the doctor may even suspect a dysregulation, they should be careful about this one. Now also, thyroid disease exhibits a 10 to 1 female to male predisposition. So women are 10 times more prone to thyroid dysregulations, so they should be even more careful. So that is one care. The second care is the pregnancy. And if you would see the studies that I would show today, almost all studies will exclude pregnant women from using povidone iodine for COVID or for any other reason. So if you see here, PVPI, which is povidone iodine, is absorbed through the skin and the vaginal mucosa and nose as well, resulting in sudden increase in the urinary excretion of iodine and a short-term variation in concentrations of thyroid hormones in maternal serum. This metabolic effect could have consequences for the embryo and the fetus during crucial stages of development. So this is a very important thing to note. Okay, now I'm going to go over these studies. The studies are here and I, you can see, have done a lot of homework today and I still have not actually covered all studies. There are tons of kinds of nasal sprays and tons of studies. This is just a primer. This is just a start for us to begin thinking about it. So let's go to now back to my drawings. So we just saw this Viraldine and Cofix Rx cease and desist by FDA. We saw Cenotize. Now some studies. This is a study, Southeast Asia, India, Pakistan type countries. This is, I believe, from India. And this is, I believe, also Cenotize, Cenotize sponsored study. SARS-CoV-2 accelerated clearance using a novel nitric oxide nasal spray treatment, a randomized trial. So what they did in this treatment was, in this trial was, they had adults 18 to 70 years of age with mild symptoms. A randomized, double-blinded, it was a multi-center study, parallel groups were formed, it was a placebo-controlled study and it was a phase three trial. So it was an efficacy testing instead of dose testing. And they used or included patients who were at high risk, for example, of becoming severe, for example, patients whose age was 45 and over. There were 153 patients on the iodine, sorry, sanitized nasal spray, and 153 who were on placebo. There were six time daily, two sprays in each nostril, for seven days. And the solution was 0.45 milliliter of solution per dose. Again, this is sanitized so nitric oxide. Findings are very interesting. So findings are overall mean SARS-CoV-2 RNA concentration, 6.96 log copies per milliliter and 7.16 log copies per milliliter for placebo. What they're saying here is when they started, the infected patients and the uh, sorry, the placebo and infected uh, non-placebo, both groups had similar virus viral copies in their nose. So they started similarly. Then once they started using the povidone, uh, sorry, the nitric oxide, then what happened was, if you see here, secondary endpoint, I'm going to go to secondary. The, the primary endpoint mean treatment difference 
SARS-CoV-2 RNA change from baseline to the end of treatment was 0.52 copies with nons compared to placebo. Now, secondary endpoint assessment demonstrated a greater proportion of patients receiving nons, 82.8% cleared SARS-CoV-2 by the end of the therapy compared to placebo, which was 66.7. So 82.8% had cleared their SARS-CoV-2 versus 66.7 for placebo. With no virus RNA detected, a median of four days earlier compared to placebo. So this was the nitric oxide study that not only it was more accelerated in clearance, it actually reduced the number of days of active infection as well. Interpretation, use of nitric oxide in patients recently infected with SARS-CoV-2 accelerated nasal virus clearance. Again, this is not yet, as the site said, approved in US or Canada. It's a Canadian company that has to go outside of these two countries to get their uh, product out. Then this is the second study. It is a preprint. And if you see here, this is actually, I believe, 22nd August. So it is a very recent preprint. What is this preprint? They are saying they were looking for very verucidal effect or verucidal effect or very virus killing effect of the 0.4% povidone iodine. What I have seen in all of these studies collectively that anything less than 1% povidone iodine has not been helpful. So here is 0.4% povidone iodine, which I would already suspect that will not have a great result. And what they did was, this is an interesting study. Once the patient was tested positive, they gave the person povidone iodine sprays and they took a nasal swab, nasopharyngeal swab, three minutes and four hours after the spray. And they had given three puffs in each nostril. And this study's conclusion. So this is a very interesting study. Just give the spray and then take the swab within three minutes and four hours. We concluded that 0.4% PVPI nasal spray demonstrated minimal virucidal eff efficacy at three minute post exposure. At four hours post exposure, the viral titers was, titer was considerably unchanged from baseline in 10 cases. The 0.4% PVPI nasal spray showed poor virucidal activity and is unlikely to reduce transmission of SARS CoV 2 in prophylaxis use. This is a very, <coughs> excuse me, it's a very small amount. So this is the latest. It is a preprint as well. Now here is another study. This study is from Egypt. It is combined nasal oropharyngeal povidone iodine plus glycerizic acid spray. And their um, Observation was that it worked really well. So what did they do? This was a randomized placebo-controlled trial. There was 0.5% povidone iodine and glycerizic acid, 2.5 milligram per milliliter solution. There were 100 patients in the nasal spray group and 100 in the placebo group. All of them were between 18 to 80 years, and they were both genders they were given standard hospital care plus the povidone iodine or placebo spray. So the standard hospital care they had was vitamin C, paracetamol, and zinc. No quercetin, nothing else. Very interesting. And they both groups got that. But the nasal spray, one got placebo and the other one nasal spray, and for six days, they, six times daily, these patients were given them. So now let's look at the results. 200 patients were randomly allocated to two equal groups, treatment and placebo. Treatment accelerated the recovery of PCR on day four, seven, and 10, as evidenced by the PCR positive patients. So now check this out. On the day four, 70% and 99% of those on the 70% on the dose with the nasal spray 
which was povidone iodine and and plus cerezic acid and 99% who were on placebo then seventh day 20% on the therapy and 65% on placebo still had the nasal virus or, or the virus in the nose nose and then 10th day only 1% on the therapy side or the iodine plus cerezic acid side had the the PCR positive and 10% on the placebo side. Treatment enhanced the early recovery day 7.6 versus 8.9. So seven day versus nine day. Treatment promoted early recovery of a nosmia and a gusia. This is what I saw a lot in various studies that olfaction and return of olfaction was accelerated when it was used. I can tell you my own experience as well. So I became a nose, I had a nosmia and my wife had a nosmia. My son did not have it. And uh, three things helped. One, I cannot name. Second, zinc. And the third one was this, the this Cofix Rx. I would actually feel that every time I take this, within an hour or two, my nose would start functioning normally. And then about the evening, I'll start having anosmia again. But fortunately, at this time, now I'm fully back to normal. But that is what I was observing. Three things, zinc, IV, and the uh, Cofix Rx. So that is just my experience. So here they are saying treatment promoted early recovery of anosmia and agusia. In both the treated and control groups that this happened, there was a notable reduction in transmission of the virus among the household close contacts in the treatment group, 4% versus 76% in placebo group. And this it's kind of a lesson for me as well, that if I was using this, I would probably not have given it to my, my family or the chances would have reduced. Anyways, this is a study here. There was a notable reduction in transmission of the virus among the household close contacts in the treatment group, 4% versus 76% in the placebo group. So this is the study that shows that it works, but this is a combination, it's a mixture of not just the povidone, but it is povidone plus glycerizic acid. Then here is another study, Australian Journal of Otolaryngology. In this study, they talk about the in vivo humans and in vitro inactivation of SARS-CoV-2 with 0.5% povidone iodine. So once again, 0.5%. So here they're saying that two SARS-CoV-2 virus isolated, isolates were exposed to 0.5 PVP nasal spray for different times in vitro, in the petri dish in the, um, in the lab. With PCR and cell culture, cultures used to assess the impact on viral infectivity and RNA copies. Then they also did an open label in vivo humans, single arm, pilot study of 14 subjects with positive COVID-19 PCR diagnosis was also done. So two, one in vitro and one in vivo, 14 people in vivo. Baseline nasal swabs were collected to quantify SARS-CoV-2 pretreatment followed by a single 0.5% PVP nasal spray application, which is 1.12 milliliter. Nasal swabs were collected at 5, 15, and 60 minutes post-dose to assess immediate reaction. What did they find? Two studies. In vitro, the nasal spray reduced infectivity by 3.5 log T, log 10, 99.97% after 15 second exposure. This is in vitro. And eliminated detectable viral infectivity after 60 seconds. There was no effect on viral RNA detection by PCR. This is a very interesting thing. They, they mentioned it twice, that the RNA detection was not affected. But culturable virus or actual infection 
was reduced. That means the viral debris may be present, but the actual viable active virus was not there. It got broken up. In vivo, culturable virus was obtained from 6 of 14 PCR confirmed positive patients. In these subjects, five minutes after the single PVPI dose, the mean viral titer was reduced by 65% versus the baseline and 79% versus baseline at 60 minutes. Five of the six subjects, 83%, had reduction or secession of viral shedding at five minutes in all six subjects. Virus titer 60 minute post dose were below baseline. So, number one, the virus got broken up. Number two, the culturable infective virus was reduced. Number three, shedding was reduced. This is their. Um, Australian companies, uh, sorry, research. And it is in the Australian Journal of Otolaryngology. Then here is one more study. This is from Stanford, our Stanford, 15 minutes from my home Stanford. And this is the effect of povidone iodine nasal spray on nasopharyngeal SARS-CoV-2 viral load, a randomized controlled trial. And this is by the Department of Otolaryngology and Head and Neck Surgery. What do you expect from this study? What do you think? So before I actually go over this, think about it for a second in your head. What would you get from this one? So their study said, whatever were the dose, povidone iodine does not work, except a little higher dose was able to statistically significantly reduce patient symptoms. And that's it. So here, let's just very quickly look at it. They say mean cycle threshold value increased over time in all groups. Placebo, so they had three groups. Placebo group, then there was one group, I think that was 1% povidone iodine. And then there was another group that was 2% povidone iodine. So they said that all three groups actually had equal cycle threshold changes. So meaning it didn't do anything except once again for symptoms. So mean CT values increased over time in all groups with no statistically significant difference noted in the rate of change between placebo and PVP. I, povidone iodine groups. The 2% group showed statistically significant improvement in all symptom categories. However, it is it also reported a high rate of nasal burning. And please remember, using these over long periods of time can cause nasal damage. Plus, as you can see, can disrupt iodine and thyroid behaviors as well. Olfaction via UPSIT showed improvement by at least one category in all groups. There was no hospitalization or mortalities within 30 days of study enrollment on placebo or povidone iodine. Conclusion, saline and low concentration PVPI nasal sprays are well tolerated. Similar reduction in SARS-CoV-2 nasopharyngeal viral load were seen over time in all groups, meaning including placebo. All treatment groups showed improvement in olfaction over 30 days, again, including placebo. These data suggest that dilute version of PVP eye nasal spray are safe for topical use in the nasal cavity, but the PVP eye does not demonstrate viricidal activity in COVID-19 positive patients. That is our dear Stanford for us. Then this is another study. It's printed in SAGE. This is from Miami, Florida. And here, what they are talking about is the following. Let me see if I can increase this a little more. Method, povidone iodine nasal antiseptic formulation and PVPI oral rinse antiseptic formulations from 1% to 5%. Concentrations as well as controls were studied for viricidal efficacy against the SARS-CoV-2. 
Test compounds were evaluated for ability to inactivate SARS-CoV-2 as measured in a virucidal assay. SARS-CoV-2 was exposed directly to the test compound for 60 seconds. Compounds were then neutralized and surviving virus was quantified. All concentration of nasal antiseptic and oral rinse antiseptic evaluated completely inactivated the SARS-CoV-2. Conclusion, nasal and oral PVPI antiseptic solutions are effective at inactivating the SARS-CoV-2 at a variety of concentration after 60 seconds exposure time. So this is the discussion. This is the mixture of studies. Interestingly, I could actually see the study coming from a specific organization and already have a thought for where they are going to go. And I almost seemed like magically able to detect what would happen. So this is the discussion. Thank you very much for watching. I am curious for how your experience has been. I told you about my experience. I really keep it here because it helps me. Um, how Have you used any nasal sprays? Just general for sinusitis, for example, or nasal congestion, or during COVID, has that helped? How much help? Did it seem like it is just a placebo effect? Or did you actually have a benefit? Did it burn your nose for a long time? Did it cause discomfort? What was your experience? I am actually genuinely curious after reading this whole mixture and after seeing FDA's tantrums. So with this, thank you very much. There are links in the description to all of these studies. There are also links in the description. If you would like to support this work, you can buy me a coffee, you can use PayPal, you can become part of patrons, or you can buy a YouTube membership. And you can also become part of Dr. Bean, where there are another 900 lectures. The lectures on YouTube are not there. They are here. But then there are additional 900 lectures as well. So thank you very much. And I would see you tomorrow. Bye-bye for now.